So, hi hey everyone. I think we've uh, already been presented, so Bino will handle it from here. And, yeah, um, uh, I'll continue. Yeah, okay. Um, so we start out uh, with the open type as a, you know as a font in in PDF. It's um, it's a very complex subject, so we'll try to uh, be as as clear as possible. But there's some corners we'll have to cut sometimes. First of all, um, you think it would be trivial to create a PDF file with text, and in most cases, at least with English text or um, let's say Latin uh, script, it's uh, easy. You just uh, you just just you choose your font, you set the text matrix, or you move the text cursor, uh, cursor to the uh, initial position you want to put your text. Then you um, convert your Unicode cards to uh, or Unicode points to uh, PDF characters through their CIDs, and then you output just with the TJ, either um, lowercase or uh, uppercase, and you just go out because everything should be fine. That is for Latin text that goes well, uh, but uh, for the index script, the uh, that is not exactly how it goes. This is the output if you just do it naively, um, the, uh, the, uh, the one on the top. And uh, if you, most people, I, I presume, don't know Hindi. Uh, I, I don't really either. But uh, So this looks OK to us, right? It's, lig it's got ligatures, everything looks OK. But it's completely incorrect, apparently, for uh, anyone who knows Hindi. You see a lot of differences. Um, it's probably confusing for you to uh, to really see what exactly the differences are, so we highlight them for you. Uh, there's a lot of there's a number of changes. So you see the um, the blue marker, the blue blue arrow says that uh, the diacritics on top get shifted to the left. Uh, then you see that the width of one of the diacritics or, or one of the the the, um, the bows is uh, a lot wider. And then you see that two characters have been mashed together, and the, the diacritic on the bottom um, has disappeared. Um, so this is how it should be written um, in uh, Devanagari, uh, whereas uh, in PDF, if you do it just naively, it won't work. The same thing happens for another Indic script, uh, Tamil, so from the south of, uh, of India, mostly. Uh, there you see it looks a lot different, but the principle is the same. There are some substitutions, some, ch some changes that have been made, so uh, we also have um, uh, some, some clarifications. So the first two characters are switched, um, and the last character gets a big, uh, you know, a big curl at the end instead of uh, on the bottom instead of on top. Also, the little dot has changed position in the next to last character. Um, that is also something that needs to be handled. And it's not natively done if you only use Unicode. So you have to use some open type um, uh, features. So. Very simply, what is OpenType? It's a file format combining both TrueType and Type 1 outlines. But uh, it's more than that. It supports uh, all kinds of scripts, the world languages, and uh, specific features for uh, per script, per language, or uh, even custom combinations of those. Um, because this is mostly a Western audience, I'll come, uh, we'll start out with the, the principle uh, in the Latin script, which you, of course, uh, recognize. Um, so there's a, a bit of a contrived example but it show, shows some of the things that can happen in a normal uh, or in um, when, you're, when you're writing and you want your uh, font to be a bit more beautiful or a bit more fancy than just character next to character. The first one is kerning which you of course uh, know you see that uh, well I won't delve into this very much because it's uh, quite simple for um, at least for open type so we just change the uh, spaces between characters to make sure that they come across correctly and it's not uh, ambiguous which words uh, or which characters combine to find one word. Um, for if you want to go a bit more exotic, you can do uh, ligatures, optional ligatures. Uh, for example, an uppercase T-H-E can form the as one ligature. That's of course, this is font dependent. It's not something you would do in normal, um, well, let's say business uh, applications, but sometimes you really want that and uh, you have to, uh, it, it is possible, so if it's in the font, it should be able to um, output it to PDF. Same thing with uh, LI, also both uh, as uppercase. Then uh, swashes, so the K at the end, uh, it's possible to make, give it more, you know, a bit more panache uh, to uh, make it look a bit more like handwriting. Uh, that is also something that is uh, very, uh, very on, on, only possible if you use some um, 
open type features uh, and more than just the Unicode points. And then the last one, uh, alternatives for, for the ampersand. You can also have a stylistic alternative, really um, making the origin of the at, right? Where the ampersand comes from, make it more clear. That is also <coughs> something you can do. So kerning is, uh, is quite easy. You just reposition a bit, uh, in this case, a bit, uh, reposition a bit to the left. So um, the second bullet point is from the actual PDF specification, the W and the A that follows it. Um, the W is a bit wider than the A, but the A is put closer to it with the TJ operator. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, for other substitutions like ligatures and uh, the swashes, uh, you just have to get the correct glyph ID from the open type font and uh, specify it to Unicode mapping uh, if you want to be able to, to extract the text from PDF afterwards. So the, P the two Unicode mapping is not mandatory, <coughs> but of course we've been talking a lot in this uh, conference about uh, being able to use the contents of a PDF file. And if you don't do that, then you just have digital paper where, of course, we want to be more than digital paper in, uh, as PDF. <clears throat> um, the two Unicode uh, character map, so uh, there's different glyphs in the font. They have different glyph IDs, but they can also, uh, they can both um, uh, refer to the same Unicode point. For example, the uppercase letter K is 4B in, uh, in ASCII and the, you know, in Unicode, of course, uh, UTF-8 as well. Um, they have different glyphs, so the, the first two, there's some sh I'm, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the two Unicode CMAP. Mm, I'm hoping uh, pretty much everyone is. So um, different glyphs can uh, map to the same Unicode. That's why we have the map, of course. Um, if there's no uh, separate Unicode value for one, uh, for, for one ligature, right, for example, the word of the, it's, not, it's never going to have its own Unicode point. It would be insensible. You can just combine them. So the 54, 48, 45, or just uh, uppercase T, H, and E. And that's also a map. Uh, that can be used for text extraction. <clears throat> um, so the, uh, what's, what's special about uh, OpenType is it has a lot of features. Features is a bit an abstract uh, uh, concept. It can be filled in in many custom ways. There's a lot of them, about 140. So um, in this, this is not specific. Uh, they're not very special, those ones. It's just a number of them. You can see a lot of uh, entries listed with the A alone. So there's uh, a huge number of them. Um, so the open type features, mostly they are uh, a combination of two basic operations, substitutions. So the K for the K with the swash or uh, two glyphs for their ligaturized, uh, an alternative glyph uh, with, yeah, with, with both uh, of the, with the information in there. Of course, um, a big difference of course for kerning uh, is also that you have uh, uh, repositioning of glyphs. I don't know if it's very clear. I'm, I hope it is. That's the little curl on top. It's switched a bit in place, so it's just a horizontal um, move. You can see it a bit more clearly here and there with the with the in red. Uh, so that's custom combinations of both of these um, processes will combine to to to, uh, to make up for most features in uh, OpenType. There's different types uh, of um, of tags. So, so uh, the feature tags are part of the open open type layout uh, tag registry. There's uh, different types of tags. So, the script tags, for example, for uh, Devanagari, for Tamil, for Arabic, for um, Cyrillic, for you know, a lot of different things. Um, there are some even with uh, two implementations. So, the Deva one uh, is already deprecated, replaced by uh, Dev2. Um, if the script is not specific enough, for example, you have uh, in um, in the Latin script, you for example, you have Turkish. The Turkish has uh, some custom characters, some custom uh, uh, glyphs, and uh, so they can be specified not on script level but on the language level. And then the feature tags, which are can be a combination, can be something custom. It's um, quite uh, customizable. Uh, explicitly so, because the font developers are also free to define and register their own features. So this is 
a bit overview and now I'll give the word to uh, Alexei and he can explain how everything's organized in yeah. OpenType. Thank you. Yeah, now comes the um, more technical part. So we're going to have to look, have a look at how is everything organized in, in OpenType. So the main structural element in OpenType is um, a table and uh, for two basic uh, operations we've uh, took a look at. So for substitution and for positioning, there is um, a G sub uh, table, which stands for glyph substitution, and G post table, which stands for uh, glyph uh, positioning. And this is uh, pretty much how uh, G sub table is uh, organized. So uh, on top uh, there is a script list, and um, well, each script um, can have uh, can, can refer to multiple languages. So as Benoit said, uh, some languages have uh, their specificities. So um, each script uh, refers some languages. Uh, languages in turn refer to a feature list, which is necessary to correctly render that language. Well, some of uh, the features are not necessary. We'll talk about this a little bit uh, later. And uh, features in turn uh, are nothing more than a set of a uh, lookup list. And uh, there are uh, many types of uh, lookups defined in the open type spec. So you can see uh, them on the right. I won't uh, elaborate a lot uh, on it, but uh, well, uh, some of the types you've uh, already seen, like uh, single substitution substitutes uh, one glyph for, for one glyph, so it was the case of swashes, and um, like many to one uh, substitution, it was the case for uh, ligaturizing of uh, the word uh, the. Um, and uh, this is a more specific example from, from a real phone, so uh, a font can support uh, different scripts from different parts of the world, like uh, in this case uh, Arabic uh, script is supported as, as well as the Cyrillic one and the uh, Greek one. Uh, for Arabic font in this sample there are two language implementations, uh, I, I believe they are called Farsi and Urdu. And the uh, Urdu language has uh, these four features necessary to, to correctly shape uh, text in that language. And um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, for all the scripts, uh, there is also a default uh, language implementation. So you might uh, know that, uh, well, some text comes from from specific script, but you don't know the correct, uh, the, the exact language. So you can always uh, go to default implementation and, well, in most cases, it will give you the correct result. Um, for GPOS um, tables, it's uh, pretty much the same. Uh, of course, the lookup types uh, well differ a lot. They mean uh, different things. And uh, well, one of the simplest, uh, uh, most simple types is uh, kerning. So it just um, uh, tells you that uh, between two specific glyphs, the space should be adjusted uh, in some way. Either uh, should be made uh, more wide or more narrow. Uh, of course, uh, there are more complex um, uh, types of uh, positioning, like uh, when you have a uh, diacritical mark, um, these uh, uh, lookup types uh, could say you, well, the exact position where you, your uh, diacritical mark should be placed. Well, we'll have a look at an example a bit uh, later. Um, so we've seen uh, that there are GSAP and GPOS features. But uh, you might have a question, uh, well, how do you apply them and uh, when and how to do it? I, I just got a text, so what do I do next? Actually, the answer is in the spec. So this is uh, a real example for a uh, Latin uh, script. So you can see that uh, there are uh, four, uh, four features for, for a Latin script. And uh, I mean the default implementation, not, correct, not exact uh, language, but just uh, let's stick to, to default. And uh, three of those features, uh, and uh, they all happen to be positioning ones, so three of them are required. So you can uh, skip uh, all, uh, all four other features, but uh, well, in order to correctly like, render um, uh, the, the, the text in, in Latin script, you, you must uh, apply these three features. But of course, uh, this is what the spec says, and uh, the font developers well, might have another opinion about that. They are free to, to define their own features. They're free to, to not define the obligatory ones. So um, actually, in every case, you have to work with the uh, specific font file. And it's only about the font file. You'll, um, the spec uh, says you nothing but the uh, feature names. And uh, all the information is uh, in the font file. 
Mm. Uh, the, the algorithm from the second slide uh, looked uh, pretty easy and uh, it works in, in most cases, but uh, there is a small uh, country called uh, India with uh, a billion uh, people there. Uh, of course, not of them can read and write, but still. Uh, the algorithm for rendering uh, Indic uh, scripts uh, looks much co more complicated for a country which, which is not um, very literate. Uh, so um, the first two steps uh, don't even uh, have to do anything with uh, OpenType, with the topic of uh, our talk, but still they are necessary to then correctly apply OpenType features. Without uh, those two steps you can uh, go home, well OpenType won't help you. So the first uh, step is called clustering into syllables and uh, in Unix scripts, as we'll see a little bit later, um, well, the undividable part of a, of a text is not a single glyph like in, it's in English. So in English you have a single glyph which corresponds to a single Unicode character. For Indic it's not the case, we'll see it later. Then uh, there comes uh, some reorderings which uh, well, are, are done by very peculiar rules, but uh, again, we, we can do nothing about this. We can just uh, study those rules and uh, try to apply them. And then uh, we apply substitutions and positionings, and this is, well, a uh, fairly easy part, thanks to OpenType specification. This is a more, um, uh, well, visual example for those of you who want to see it uh, in real. So. Uh, on top, uh, on the left, you see the Unicode sequence consisting of uh, three of, of six uh, Unicode uh, uh, characters, and on the right, you see the word uh, which would uh, which you would uh, just uh, get with the algorithm from the second slide. Um, then, uh, well, we we go for the first uh, part of our algorithm, namely clustering into uh, syllables, and it turns out that uh, for those uh, six characters, well, and uh, as I recall, well, it all happens on Unicode level uh, only. So there are uh, there happen to be two syllables for this world. They are colored in uh, in different uh, in different colors, and um, then uh, the reordering uh, comes uh, into place. So for the first syllable, uh, these uh, two uh, characters are swapped, and uh, as you can see on the right, this uh, cap, which uh, happened to be in the middle of the world, uh, of the world, is now in the in the start. Um, and um, for the second syllable, uh, we are pretty lucky, and uh, nothing is changed in in this case. Um, so then uh, uh, we go for applying uh, open type features, and um, you see on the top uh, the results from the previous slide after the Unicode manipulations. So after the GSAP uh, features application, you see uh, on the second line that uh, that the critical mark uh, on top, uh, on bottom, on the bottom is gone, and uh, you see another uh, another glyph uh, has been substituted instead. And uh, after GPOS uh, features application, I'm not sure if it's visible well enough, but uh, there was a small gap uh, between the. Uh, second to last and last uh, glyphs, and uh, after the GPOS uh, uh, features application, uh, this gap is gone. And uh, well, that uh, that's pretty vital for for some <coughs> cases. For this case, it might look like well, it's just a gap, but uh, uh, sometimes it's it's really necessary for for correct comprehension. So um, I won't touch uh, well. Too, ma too much on uh, different types of uh, GSAP uh, features uh, implementation, but the uh, Noah has already covered one-to-one uh, -one, uh, glyph substitution. So, uh, well, all you have to care about is uh, about outputting the correct uh, glyph ID to your content stream and then defining the two Unicode uh, mapping correctly. And uh, that's the idea behind uh, all the other types of uh, substitutions, like one-to-many, many-to-one, and uh, uh, alternate substitutions as well. Um, there are also contextual substitutions, but well, the idea is the same. You have to define to Unicode uh, mapping correctly and uh, everything will be good. But as we'll see a little bit later, that's not uh, the case uh, uh, in, uh, in every situation. But let's uh, stick for more easy part for now. So for GPOS features, 
there are, uh, I believe there are seven lookup tables uh, in the spec, but there are probably uh, only six uh, here on the slide. But they can be well um, categorized into two types, uh, into two basic types, uh, namely adjustment and uh, attachment. So uh, adjustment basically means that uh, you have to adjust your cursor position after you've uh, output uh, a glyph. An attachment is a more complicated one. It says that uh, there are two glyphs and uh, they, are, uh, they should be attached uh, by somehow to, to each other. So we'll, we'll also see a more verbose example. Um, but it turns out that uh, for all those um, types of, uh, of GPOS uh, lookups, we only need uh, to know little information to implement uh, everything correctly in, in all cases. So namely, we have to uh, well remember two numbers for placement and uh, advance, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it means exactly uh, in a moment. And uh, we have to also remember an offset to attaching point. So this is what, uh, what I was referring to when I said that two glyphs uh, should be stick together. So for the uh, glyph you are currently going to output, you have to have a reference to, to the glyph you are going to attach it to. So here is a, here is a picture demonstrating everything. Um, well, we had adjustment and attachment, and it's called advance and uh, placement here. So uh, adjustment means uh, advance on this slide. So after you have uh, output uh, a glyph, you just have to adjust your cursor position by some amount of space in the horizontal axis and the same for vertical axis. Uh, so that's very easy and this uh, looks like kerning, uh, but just uh, sometimes you have to do it also in, uh, in vertical axis. Um, for, uh, for attachment it's uh, more complicated and uh, I tried to <laughs> visualize it as, as good as I could. So uh, remember um, uh, you have uh, two glyphs uh, that are going to be attached to well, one to another. So basically there is a base glyph which is uh, uh, letter M in our case and there is a diacritical mark uh, uh, over this letter and um, our goal is to place it uh, correctly. So uh, in gray color you see the result which you would get without any uh, GPOS uh, features. So uh, let's say for the purpose of the demonstration that uh, this result does not satisfy us. and. Um, Actually, in case of, uh, of attachment, uh, there are, uh, well, uh, two so-called end cores defined for the base glyph and for the uh, glyphs we are going to attach, so for the diacritical mark, and our goal is to, well, combine them all together so that uh, they are in the same point in, uh, in absolute coordinates. Um, so you see e that in the case of, uh, of the gray uh, diacritical mark, well, its, um, um, its uh, anchor is not matched to the anchor of uh, the base glyph. So we basically have to do some cursor manipulations and, uh, and well, so that uh, they are combined uh, together. So this converts uh, into algorithm for GPOS features. Uh, well, advance is uh, easy and uh, it's uh, the latter part. So the former part is about placement. So in case of placement, you, as I mentioned, you have to uh, refer to the glyph you're going to attach your current glyph to. So you kind of uh, roll back your cursor to the state where, where it was when you, uh, well, uh, when you output that, uh, that glyph. Then you just calculate the difference between the anchors and, uh, well, you adjust your cursor again by this amount. You then are free to show your current glyph and uh, then you roll back to the position uh, where you were uh, when you started showing uh, that glyph because uh, attachment means that um, it doesn't affect uh, the, uh, the placement of the following glyphs after this uh, the critical mark. And you notice here that uh, I used um, TD uh, operators in, um, in brackets everywhere. Um, and actually, uh, for horizontal placement only, this, uh, of course, can be replaced with a capital TJ operator, like uh, the one used uh, for kerning. But for vertical placement, there is uh, no alternative in, in PDF, and uh, the capital TJ will not be enough, so we need to use uh, TD operator, and, uh, well, TD operator will appear in the middle of, uh, of the world, of the word. 
So it's not even uh, in a single TJ operator and this actually introduces uh, uh, problems for text extraction and for many viewers when you try to copy paste your text. So on the left you see an example of an uh, indic word which uh, is rendered uh, correctly and on the right um, there is a copy pasted version of uh, that same word from, from one of the viewers. So you see that uh, a space, uh, an extra space is uh, inserted and uh, that's a problem that, uh, well, that's uh, not very well uh, implemented in, in most of the viewers. Uh, well, now comes the, probably the trickiest part of, of these slides. Um, we are uh, going back to our Unicode. You remember, well, I just skipped over that when uh, I mentioned uh, substitutions. Um, so our goal, uh, our primary goal is to be able to extract uh, the uh, text uh, in complex scripts uh, correctly from, from the PDFs. And uh, of course, uh, well, we don't care about those uh, spaces probably, at least let's, let's extract it uh, somehow. So uh, let's consider an example of, uh, of a word uh, we've already seen. So it has uh, six uh, Unicode characters in that. And um, uh, on the bottom you see uh, the output you would get if you just output a single glyph by glyph, uh, if you just converted Unicode uh, characters to glyphs and uh, output them. And on the top, uh, the, the, there is a correct uh, output, so, well, it, uh, it differs uh, dramatically. And uh, actually there are three uh, glyphs resulting in the output, so uh, six uh, Unicode characters resulted in, in only three glyphs. Um, as you can see, uh, the first two glyphs uh, can be, well, easily mapped to uh, to the to the Unicode uh, representations. That's uh, that's not so hard to visually check it. But well, what do we do for the fourth glyph? We have uh, like four unused Unicode characters. So what do we do with that? Um, we'll get uh, back to it <laughs> a bit uh, later. Uh, but now let's um, let's have an overview of how the same things are implemented in uh, like browsers or viewers. Um, they have uh, a, m a bit more easy uh, task because uh, they actually have a top of two buffer approach. They keep uh, a buffer with uh, the actual glyphs shown on, this, on the screen, and uh, they keep uh, a second buffer with the actual Unicode uh, string uh, representation. So it's uh, more easy to uh, match, uh, to, to have a correspondence between those two. And uh, as I said that uh, for uh, index scripts, uh, there is a concept of a syllable or cluster. So it's an undividable part and uh, your browser actually knows that. So uh, this is our word uh, which uh, contains uh, three glyphs, but it actually just two syllables. And uh, when you try to select this text in your browser, you won't be able to select uh, a distantly uh, second or third glyph. You will be only able to select uh, both of them simultaneously. And um, well, this um, um, in some way makes uh, our lives a bit uh, uh, easier because uh, we can reduce uh, our task uh, to just, uh, well, at least being able to copy paste uh, uh, syllables correctly. But in PDF, of course, we don't have this uh, top buffer approach when we have content stream with uh, glyph IDs and uh, our only way back is uh, to Unicode. <coughs> so uh, we have to some, somehow come up with uh, the correct uh, to Unicode mapping for, for our characters. Now we get back to our mysterious uh, third glyph. We have uh, for unused, so-called, let's call it unused uh, Unicode characters. And uh, well, it's natural to think that let's try to, to map uh, this glyph somehow to those uh, four uh, values because we can map a single glyph to multiple Unicode values. But it turns out that Indic doesn't work that way. So if you take all the 24 possible combinations of uh, those uh, four Unicode characters and you try to output um, them on your screen, this is what you get and you, I bet you won't be able to find our necessary glyph in that table, believe it or not. So it says that uh, 
Well, during uh, that uh, shaping uh, process, the other glyph from the second syllable, which uh, we were able to find uh, mapping to Unicode for, uh, it uh, actually affected the way the shaping process worked. So it's not independent. It's very uh, tied all together. <clears throat> so how do we actually map our glyphs? Uh, well, one approach you might, you might come up with uh, is well to uh, try to divide your uh, Unicode sequence into uh, into consequent pieces and uh, try to linearly map your uh, glyphs to uh, your uh, to your Unicode uh, uh, sequence. So we don't care about our first syllable because it only consists of uh, one uh, glyph and uh, one Unicode uh, letter. Uh, one Unico Unicode character, we, we, can, we care about the second syllable, which is uh, two glyphs and uh, five uh, Unicode characters. So we might just uh, divide those uh, five uh, characters into two parts and assign a two Unicode mapping uh, of one glyph to three Unicode characters and uh, of a second glyph to two Unicode characters. And this uh, will actually work uh, in our case. So when we just copy our syllable all together, we just get uh, two glyphs, and for those uh, two glyphs, uh, the concaten concatenated uh, to Unicode mapping uh, correspondingly uh, gives uh, what we want, gives us what we want. But actually, this uh, approach won't work uh, in case we add uh, another word which contains uh, this very glyph and which contains uh, this very value in its Unicode representation, but uh, when it's preceded uh, by some other characters, this won't be uh, this won't work correctly because for for our second glyph, we added some uh, trash Unicode characters to to Unicode mapping, and uh, in case we try to now copy uh, this second uh, second added word we'll uh, get some trash characters in our uh, buffer. And uh, well, so this tells us that uh, it doesn't work. And actually this approach is not something I came up uh, with uh, for the purpose of the, of the presentation. This is actually an approach used uh, in one of the major PDF producers today. So you see that uh, it's a challenge for, for PDF uh, industry, uh, but uh, there is a life boy in the PDF spec. Actual text is uh, here for us. Um, its uh, main purpose is that uh, you can specify the replacement text for some part of the uh, content stream. And actually, this is uh, how our uh, solution of that problem will work. So forget about all these, uh, well, uh, two Unicode mappings. You can, uh, uh, you can specify for this problematic cluster whatever you want because uh, actual text uh, has, to, has to replace the actual content and has to override this two Unicode behavior with uh, the glyphs which are written right in the attribute of uh, which called actual text <laughs> of this uh, span element. So uh, you remember that we only had problems with the second uh, syllable consisting of uh, two glyphs. So we output uh, the first syllable as is and for, for this second syllable, we output our two glyphs, but we specify actual text and we specify our uh, five Unicode characters uh, in it. And uh, well, and it should work. So will it work, Benoit? Well, uh, it's not supported in most of the PDF viewers. Um, and even if it is, there's usually, as uh, Alexei has already said, there's problems when you, uh, for determining spaces, because um, most viewers that do implement it will insert a space even in the middle of a word. There's um, some, uh, yeah, there's still some problems in, in any implementation that I've found at least. <clears throat> Um, so a little addition about uh, these features and algorithms is that these lookup tables, they're just entries in a font, but they don't know all the rules of a script. Uh, for example, so in, in uh, Divanagri, uh, you have uh, half characters, so this is the general concept of uh, if you uh, concatenate two uh, glyphs to each other and there's no vowel in between both of the sounds, then only half of the glyph will be shown. Uh, so there's a number of combinations that, that occur because of that. It's, um, there's, those don't have their separate Unicode points, 
so it has to be encoded in the open type um, feature uh, but it's uh, this can be a bit tricky because if you blindly apply all the features then you also get errors uh, you need to know for um, at some level at least what this uh, script says for example the glyph with the um, uh, with the um, diacritic on at the bottom um, it will automatically get get replaced if you apply the open type features but it can't be because this is something specific of Divnagri is that you can you cannot um, put a half character at the end of a word. So you have to know that. You have to implement that as a, um, when you're produ as a PDF producer, you have to implement that, that if it's at the end of the world, after at the end of the word, you um, cannot do this substitution. So you cannot blindly apply all the features. And uh, in this case, uh, you have to set up uh, masks for features during the pre-processing, so the um, initial uh, um, Glyph reordering and uh, and the, the syllable uh, construction that you have to do in the uh, Unicode stage of the of the glyph rendering process. Um, this is uh, very shortly. Uh, um, uh, there's a difference between uh, the the Indic script family and Arabic because um, well, there's some details about Arabic. Of course, it's right to left, but everything in Arabic is encoded in Unicode. So there's um, different uh, Unicode points for uh, uh, for the glyphs, depending on where they arrive, uh, where they occur in the word. You probably know that there's a lot of leisureization in Arabic. This is mandatory, so because you don't have to know the language to, or, or have at least an algorithm uh, that understands at least a little bit of the language to understand this, everything can be done in Unicode. So that's a big difference. Arabic doesn't usually need uh, open type features, unless for, for example, for uh, Urdu and Farsi. Um, but the standard language doesn't really need that. Um, so this, the, th the four features, there are actually um, uh, open type features uh, in its MIDI, final and uh, Liga. Um, so for the positions in the word, but they're also encoded in Unicode. So if you don't have an open type font, you can still render Arabic. This is impossible for the um, index scripts in general. There's also a bit about uh, so uh, reverse cars. You can have a um, marked content uh, that uh, says that uh, as, an, um, as a hint for text extraction that you uh, your characters should be read right to left instead of just uh, left to right. Um, this is an implementation detail. And also very briefly an example. So the first line is the Arabic uh, left to right which um, looks terrible to well, anyone who understands a little bit of Arabic. Then to the, right, uh, the, the second line is at least to the uh, right to left, and, but it's just the characters, also unreadable for most Arabs, uh, and only the last line uh, means something uh, to them. It's al Sa'ar al Jumeli. Yes. And uh, so they can understand that, but of course you don't need uh, open type for that. So why do we need OpenType, as I said already, for non-obligatory font-specific features and positioning um, uh, details that cannot be implemented in Unicode itself. That's why you need OpenType. Um, because of the uh, ligatures, for example, in uh, Devanagari, you have about 40 characters. All of them com can combine with each other as um, have characters, so that would have to be 1600 Unicode points. It is not done like that, it's encoded in the fonts. Um, so there's too many of them, so you encode them in lookup tables and you let the font um, handle all of this uh, very complex subject matter. Because of course, there's not only Devanagari in, in, the, uh, in the Indic script family, there's about 50 other scripts that have similar rules. So there's, um, there might not be enough space even in the Unicode uh, standards for all of those uh, variations. Um, so it is possible uh, to have um, um, to have surf so some glyphs present in a font because they're, they're, the ligatures are optional. Uh, so if they're not, it's too hard to, well, it's not, it is hard, but it is possible to check all the options, but it will get your performance down dramatically. So um, that's why also the, all the transformations uh, are um, encoded in lookup tables so that you can at least check are they there? And if they're not, we can ignore them. If they're there, we just also still let the font handle them and just render the glyphs. <coughs> okay, so to summarize, um, open type features, well, they vary from obligatory and mandatory to 
render complex scripts like uh, indic ones to something really <coughs> stylistic and typography-like, like swashes and uh, some uh, discretionary ligatures, and uh, even to like fine-tuning your colon in your alarm clock in your iPhone, which is actually a real feature in uh, the San Francisco font introduced by Apple. And everything can be supported in uh, PDF technically if uh, the community well puts some effort uh, in it. But for, for the case of complex scripts, you shouldn't forget about uh, Unicode preprocessing. You shouldn't forget about knowing some specific, uh, specifics, uh, specific details about uh, scripts you are work working with. Uh, so you just don't uh, blindly just run this um, algorithm and hope for the perfect result. Um, so PDF and OpenType is uh, indeed a very solid and necessary match, but uh, it, uh, it's, it has to be implemented in a way, well, if not to use uh, the word uh, workaround. Uh, so it has to be implemented in a way that's not uh, very well supported by different PDF uh, toolkits. So there is a great place for, for improvements in, in this area. So here are a couple of uh, references, so mainly the specs, but you can always contact us and uh, ask more questions. Thank you.